Hey, welcome back to the Popside Podcast. Uh, host Jeremy Todd coming to you from the world headquarters in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You know, it's been, we actually saw the sun today, which is, you know, I tell you, it's one of the things that affects me more than anything. And I, and I, I and I, uh, I try and be cognizant of it, but when it's cloudy day after day after day after day, it gets tough sometimes. And I take my vitamin D, I try and stay as healthy, I try and work out a little bit, but I'm always looking for help. I'm always looking for different ideas. And today at the Wednesday interview series is no different. We're going to be my man Thane Marcus on here in just a second, and I'm excited to have him on there. We're going to get into a little bit of health stuff, but Thane, well, hey, first of all, brother, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I definitely can relate on the sun talk. It's a uh... It's one of those things where if we don't get enough sun in our lives, it's hard to be positive. So it definitely fuels that. And I think it's fitting for uh, for the name of your show and what you're all about. Well, let's talk about that real quick, because, you know, I I, I mean, again, do you have any like techniques or anything to stay positive? Because, you know, obviously, I'm, you know, I'm known as the positive side guy, you know what I'm saying? So I, I hear it all the time. But man, oh, man, this time of year and, and you're you're out in Colorado, right? I am. Yep. Okay. In Denver. So obviously it gets a little colder, but you have way more sun than we do. So what would you say to someone? Hey, I'm just trying to stay positive. I'm just trying to keep things going. What do you say to somebody like myself? You know, I think it really revolves around getting to know ourselves and what makes us positive because every individual is so unique and, and has unique value uh, and interest in things that others don't. And so for me, it could be something as just really enjoying that morning cup of coffee. I'm a big fan of coffee. And so if, if, you know, I'm feeling down a little bit, maybe I just really um, celebrate kind of that sacrament or that practice of a morning cup of coffee and brewing it and really enjoying all the aspects of it and being more present with it. So I I think we got to recognize first what we find value in, what we find enjoyment in, what brings us life, what gives us life. And then once we recognize it, when we feel like we're a little low, really center in and be present with those practices. Uh, For instance, you know, one of the things that I really need in life is exercise. I really need something just to get my heart racing and pumping and, and kind of be out of breath. And so today, uh, we traveled last weekend, my wife and I for a funeral of one of her friends. And um, so we were out of the rhythm gone for three or four days. And then it's been a hectic couple days back here in town. And so today was the first day of kind of like, I I really need to get some exercise in. So I just went midday today to the park, brought a kettlebell and, you know, it wasn't fun. It didn't feel good, but I needed it. And that actually boosted my attitude and made me more positive, even heading into this interview today because of, of knowing myself and knowing what fuel I need in that and, and then applying that fuel, especially when we don't feel like it. Well, real quick on the on the coffee question, what kind of coffee are you drinking? I'm a coffee. I love coffee. What kind of, what, what do you drink? You know, I uh, I like making pour overs at home, so I have a Chemex here. I, I drink a lot of single origins, but I also like blends. Uh, there's a local roastery here in Denver called uh, Sweet Bloom. They're one of my favorites, and there's a cafe that serves them that's about three houses down, which is really dangerous having a cafe that close oh, yeah. to where you live. So I kind of have to show some self control uh, on how much I go over there. So I'll usually buy a bag that'll last a week or two, and then occasionally stop by for a cup there if you haven't tried bulletproof my friend you need to get on bulletproof coffee it's the greatest coffee ever i've drank it straight now for probably about two years i, I cheated once i got some another organic um coffee from the co-op that we have close close by and went right back to the bulletproof it just gets me fired up it gets my brain sharp in the morning yeah. and i'm all over that uh real quick again we're talking to thane marcus and and all around badass i mean pro former pro golfer development coach speaker writer podcast coach and and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here, and, and because of the workout, because of the tenacity, because of the you know, just being all around badass and crushing life, it's interesting this time of year. I just did a three-part series about having the best year ever. And one of the things about having the best year ever, what, what is it? Today's January 13th. And I'm, I'm not sure what the fall-off day is. I think it's like January 20th where, you know, it's like Black whatever, Black Friday or something where everybody falls off on their goals mm. and everything like that. What do you tell somebody that, you know, for like you, you said that, okay, hey, you know, I didn't work out for a few days, but I need to get back on it. What do you tell somebody that wants to quit right now, or maybe even taking a couple of days off? Because you know how it is when you take a couple of days off, two days turns into a week, week turns into two weeks, and then all of a sudden you're back to normal. What do you tell someone that wants to give up? Yeah, you know, momentum is such a huge factor here. And that's really why I like to highlight or hone in on with people is that we have to recognize where we are in the rhythm of life and where the momentum is. So, for instance, in golf, if you hit a bad shot, it is very easy for that bad shot to spill over into another bad shot. And when you don't 
let, uh, if you don't stop that process or you don't consciously uh, put extra effort or focus in changing the momentum, it's going to further uh, that process out until you hit uh, multiple bad shots, have multiple bad holes, and then have a bad round as a result of that. And so we have to be aware of where momentum is. And we also have to be aware of where we are in the rhythm of life. Life has a rhythm. It has ebbs and flows, ups and downs. And that's true for every human being. So when we start out a year, it's kind of like jumping out of the, the gates in a race, right? We don't want to come out way too hot because then we're going to run out of steam for the rest of the race ahead. So we want to find that pace. The key is a lot of times finding the right pace that we can take with us throughout the entire year. And, and oftentimes we overestimate, right? I love the quote from Bill Gates. Uh, we all overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 years. And so it's this finding this right balance of, okay, what can I actually accomplish this year? And how do I not set uh, goals or expectations that are higher than I really can feasibly reach? Um, so it's finding that tension um, and then recognizing where momentum is so we can apply the right mindset, knowing that, okay, if I have missed a few days, I better gear up to um, firm up my mindset and crush this next day so I can get that momentum back on my side. And so we can adjust our mindset based on where momentum is. What do you say to somebody like, um, you know, I'm, I'm big into some of the woo stuff. You see my vision board back there. I'm big in meditation. Do you apply any of these th techniques to your daily ritual? Do you, do you meditate? Um, what does is, what is that meditation schedule look like? What is your daily schedule like? Because into the part of the, into the three part series that I did just a two weeks ago, I talked about having a schedule and how important that is. And I talk about bookending days. Talk about a normal day for you and, and how does it start? Uh, you know, do you work out every day? Because again, when you talked about, and I love what you were saying, when you come out of the gates, you know, full of piss and vinegar, and then you just fade off. I got a guy I work with, same exact thing. He was working out with guys that are just total meatheads and they're, you know, they're pushing all the weight in the world. And he got burned out. He did seven days in a row and got burned out and it hurt himself. Now he's like, you know, I don't know if I want to do this again. So talk yeah. a little bit about what a good schedule is for someone starting and talk about your schedule and, and maybe, maybe talk a little bit about the meditation if you're into that as well. Yeah. I love that you brought all that up. You know, bookends are, are another phrase that I love using as well. And it's a really helpful um, framework for us to operate off of. And I think about this idea of discipline. Uh, discipline is something I'm really uh, big about. And I think a lot of times we think uh, we, ha we approach this word discipline with a negative connotation often because as kids, it was framed negatively for us. Our first understanding of discipline often meant punishment or consequence for something we didn't do as well, right? And so then we grow up and we still have this negative connotation towards discipline a lot of times when really it's the most beautiful thing in the world and the most helpful thing for us to apply. And, and discipline is just that structure that we can then have the full freedom of our expression to come out of that. And bookends are a great example of that. If I have a really disciplined structure at the start and at the end of my day, then everything in between can be flourishing and thriving. Uh, so I think that's a great uh, framework for anyone listening. I'm glad that that you've been sharing that. Um, the The mornings for me, I, I for exercise, I like to try and move at least six days a week. I've opened up my mind a little bit more to what exercise can be. I had a great trainer, Cody Burkhart, um, who when I was playing professionally, helped me understand that fitness and exercise doesn't uh, only reside in a gym. It resides in everyday life. So um, we can do that in like going to the airport. You know, my wife and I, we have um, those duffel bags. And I love those because carrying two duffel bags through an airport all day is a great workout. Like that's a, that's a, that's an exercise. Um, and it's like carrying kettlebells in that sense. So uh, we can view all of life as exercise. And really I, I try to move six days a week. Um, I try to get in the gym to lift heavy weights at least three days a week. Um, and then I'll try to incorporate maybe a yoga, uh, yoga flow once a week. Um, and if not uh, a run around the park, there's some good uh, pull up bars and other free weight type um, bars in this run. So I can do a run with some body weight movements. Um, but regarding the bookends in the mornings, I try to wake up either sometimes 5am or 5.30am are kind of my two slots. Um, being married now as of March, it's been a little different for me finding what's best for me and my wife, not just me anymore. Um, so but the ideal rhythm for me is 5.30am or 5am if I'm getting in the gym early. And then I spend the first hour to hour and a half as dedicated time to my um, self-care practice and my faith practice. And what that means is typically I'll go get water. Um, I'll go get my water heating for the coffee. I'll go sit on my couch 
and I'll either have a quiet time of prayer or I'll have a quiet time of meditation. Um, and they serve a similar function, but a little different practice. Uh, and then I'll move into a time of reading where I read through the Bible, where I read through books that I'm, I'm learning from, um, or sit with some ideas and maybe journal out some thoughts. Um, and then once I've moved past that hour, hour and a half, I'll either go to the gym to get my lift on, or I'll maybe dive into another book just for personal development. Um, and then after another 30 minutes or so on that book, I'll um, set the priorities for the day. I've got some really cool cards here um, from Analog. So it just gives you like a, a list of um, basically one, two, three, four, 10 priorities. Uh, which I find to be really helpful because a lot of times we'll, I'll list out way too many priorities, but this is like a maximum of 10 for the day. Um, and then I just try to get after them. And this is helpful to be off the phone since it's a physical card. So I don't have to keep checking my phone and my calendar for what's on the schedule. I can have it right in front of me on paper um, so they can be more effective in my time blocking. What time do you go to sleep? I try to get my ideal amount of sleep is seven and a half to eight hours. Um, so when I, it, it's been again, different with being married and finding new rhythms sure. for us as a family, but I like to be in bed by nine 30 to 10. Uh, if I'm going to do a little reading before bed, it'll be about nine 30. If not, it'll probably be closer to 10. Um, and then it kind of depends on also where we're at with sleep. Cause I want to listen to my body as well to see what it's needing recovery wise. If I've been in the gym a lot that week, it may need a little more recovery, um, so I may get to bed a little earlier or get to uh, wake up a little bit later uh, and just adjust it a little bit. So there's some wiggle room there. You know, you know what, you know what you're talking about this, what's going through my head is interesting that, um, you know, I'm thinking about like what, like a normal quote unquote work ske or schedule is. And when and typically what we think about schedule, it's what time do I have to be at work? Mm -hmm. So you figure like my, all my schedule is I have to be at work by nine. So actually I had to wait, wake up at, you know, like you said, five or five thirty or six In reality, the, your work schedule shouldn't determine what your actual life schedule is mm -hmm. and i think we get caught up trying to balance the work schedule and not trying to balance the life schedule because if you're getting up like you said that's why i asked that question if you're getting up early you know at 5 5 30 which in, in reality and, and and again i put another content is that early or is that just a, the normal day for you maybe early would be like four for you but we but again we're trying to like it's like like trying to fit it what society tells us is like mm -hmm. nine to five we gotta fit that's our that's our schedule so i gotta wake up at seven or if i wake up at five that's so why are you getting up so early is that really early or am i or am i prioritizing my work schedule ahead of my life schedule if that makes any sense at all i don't know if that yeah no it's a it's a good thought process because you know I, a lot of times I was actually working with one of my clients this last week and he was talking about how, you know, maybe I just need a, I, maybe my ideal schedule would be like waking up earlier. And, you know, I, I just, I just responded with, I really think we have to understand who we are and how our bodies operate because there are different types of, I believe they call it phenotypes. Um, and there's four different types of phenotypes that basically is when we do our best work, then they re, re, it, re, it <laughs> resides on different parts of the day. So some people are way more creative in that 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. window, whereas other people are way more creative in the early morning. And some people are best optimal in the middle of the day. So everyone has a different rhythm. And a lot of it is discovering what's best for us. So just because I am a morning person doesn't mean that you have to be. Uh, my wife isn't. And that's totally fine. Like we, we're finding what works best for us. And it doesn't mean what's best for me is best for her. And what's best for her is best for me. And we have to find the dance in that. And that's true, I think, with everyone. So like you said, it's finding out how can my, what is best for my life schedule? And then how does that fit with my work schedule? Um, and, and finding the balance in that. And, and like you said, it, a lot of times nowadays, the work schedule is a lot different with people working from home and being more remote or virtual than ever before. And so we have to have a little bit more discipline if it's less structured of, I have to be in the office at this point. We have to start saying, okay, here's my time blocks and windows that I'm gonna set aside and really dive into the work. And then the other space is freedom to, to use as I want or need or wish with my life. You know, when I, and I, we talk about schedule and discipline, it's interesting because typically, uh, and I would, I would challenge everybody to say this, is that we already have disciplines that are set up. So if your discipline is when you get off work at five and your first thing you do is you go home and crack a brewski and start watching the bullshit news, that's discipline as well. You are disciplined mm -hmm. to something that's not serving you. Yeah, now, you are 100% disciplined because you never miss a day. You never miss a cold <laughs> brewski either. But you know what I'm saying? That's just a different type of discipline. I think what you were talking about earlier is that 
when we when we look at a discipline, we 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 think of it as a, a bad thing, but in reality, we're already disciplined and doing this, the bad things that are affecting us in our life, and we need to change our discipline, like you said, change the way you look at it. Um, I want to kind of spin this back to what you were saying earlier, um, and, and I'm always fascinated when people, uh, in general, put uh, you put on your on your website, Christ follower. Um, you know, I, I'd say on this podcast all the time, I'm, I'm agnostic at best, but I, I love and I respect so many people that are, are, are that hold their Christian values extremely, extremely important. And, and, and then how you tie that into your life. And, and I always think about to myself that, you know, when we, t- when we use the, the word Christian values, there's also Muslim values, there's also Buddhist values, there's, there's so mm-hmm. many values, but I think it all goes back to one main source. And then that's kind of where my agnostic t- comes, in, comes in is, do I believe something else is out there? serving everybody and like taking care of everything i think so i think there's one big power um but again that goes that's another conversation but but i I just i always respect people that put that in their bio because it's it's you know it's putting yourself on blast out there and and saying hey this is who i am so talk a little bit about what you mean and i and i know it's a very generalized term when you say christ follower how do you implement that in your business in your life in in, and goals and working out and i mean so i i would assume that's obviously a big part of your life so talk a little totally. bit about that. Yeah, no, I love that you brought that up. And yeah, I think um, I want people to know me for who I am, right? I want people to see me and know me for who I am just as much as I want to try and see and know others for who they are. And I think that's the most powerful thing is to be seen and heard and known as you are. And so I think sharing the worldview and perspective that we operate out of is really helpful for people knowing us. It's not saying that you have to agree. It's not saying that you have to disagree. It's just saying, this is how I see it. And this is how I operate. And if you want to know me, you you need to know that. And so that's why I put it on there. Um, And it is a huge part. It shapes a lot of um, the way I see the world and the way I try to show up in the world. Uh, And what it means to me is that I, I think that Jesus is the son of God. That's a lot of what Christians, I mean, that's the core of Christianity. It's saying that this man, Jesus, who lived on the earth several thousand years ago, uh, claimed to be the son of God and was and validated that by his resurrection from the dead. And that's kind of the core of what we believe. Um, But really being a Jesus follower to me is more than that. It's saying that I want to mimic and follow the lifestyle that he lived, the example that he led. And I think the example that Jesus led was remarkable. It was kind of flipping a lot of the things that we think the world thinks are um, important and flipping them on their head and saying the opposite often is. And he, he gave a great model of servant leadership. I think if you had to sum it up, it'd be servant leadership is leading by laying yourself down for the other um, and preferring the other, even when it is to the detriment of yourself. And um, I, I think there's so many examples and um, ways that we can see him countering the existing powers in his day, whether it be the government, whether it be religion. He actually was more opposed to religion than any other source of power in his day, which is, speaks to, again, that religion itself, organized religion has a lot of evil within it, but a lot of the core of it is good. A lot of the core of any major religion, like you said, it, it's serving a source of a higher power that promotes love. And that is, I think, the core of what God is. God is love. Now, out of that comes these structures and bureaucracies and organizations that religion is often labeled under, and that causes a lot of harm harm and damage. So it's not a perfect thing. It's it's more of an individual personal relationship with God. And through that um, source of love and power, and uh, it gives me a lot of strength to be able to give that love to others. So for me, if I can receive God's love and God's forgiveness in my life for what I've done and in my relationship with him, then that empowers me to give that unconditional love to others. And so for me, for my experience and the life I've lived, obviously I've grown up in more of that environment. So a lot of that is where I'm born, the family I'm grown up into and all those things. But for me, it, from my experience and what I've gone through in life and what I've experienced in life, it rings true and it gives me a higher purpose and calling. And um, I know that I can't do it without it. And that, that's, that's made me the man I am today. Well, I'm real proud of you, my friend. I think that's pretty awesome. And I respect that tremendously about you. Um, switch gears a little bit. Um, one of the books I've, one of my favorite books of all time is John Maxwell's book, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. Mm-hmm. We're going to go over seven questions that he asked. Um, um, well, let's just get into it. Question number one uh, for Thane is, what is the greatest lesson you have ever learned? 
the greatest lesson I have learned has got to be that words don't matter, but actions do. Um, and if you claim to be something, then you better live it. Uh, and so in, in my college years, I often, in early younger years, I claimed to be a Jesus follower. And, and that was important. I claimed that was important to me, but I lived a double life and, and, and did a lot of things that were in opposition to that. Uh, and it, that came out um, later in college. And it came out due to some decisions that I made as a team captain on the golf team um, that impacted our team, caused us to miss nationals that year in my senior year. And ultimately, it broke a ton of trust with a lot of people, including someone on the team that wasn't a part of it and had to suffer the consequences. And, um, you know, it just really reminded me that if you're not going to live a life um, worthy of following, then you shouldn't be leading anyone. Um, and it, it also reminded me if you're going to say something, you better back it up by your actions, because when it's shown that you're living hypocritically, you lose all trust and rightfully so. Um, and so that's the greatest lesson I've learned from failure and experience. And I, I aim to um, live that out daily. I think it's extremely important. I think the, auth the authenticity of that for what you're talking about is coming through too. And I really respect that too, man, because, you know, in the day and age of social media and all these fake people all over the place, fake news, uh, all the, fake everything. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just so refreshing to meet um, other authentic people that are just, hey, man, this is this is who I am. You know what I'm saying? Take it or leave it. I screw up. You screw up. But hey, at least I, I'm, I'm, I'm embracing uh, the, my struggles as well as my great accomplishments also. Mm -hmm. So I respect that a lot about you, my friend. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, question number two is, uh, what are you learning now? What I'm learning now is uh, how to be a little bit more long term in my thinking. Uh, you know, I've had a couple of grandparents pass away this past year and hearing the stories of their lives reset at those celebrations of life and um, the legacy that they've passed on to their kids and their grandkids really inspires me to think about, you know, the legacy that I'm going to leave for grandkids or great grandkids and, and what that looks like and how to make decisions now that impact future generations within my own family in 100 years time. Uh, and that's something that uh, is newer for my thought process. So I'm learning uh, what that how to involve that in my daily decisions in a way of just intentionality and infusing that intention into it. Um, and then with that, how to be sustainable in what I do. I think a lot of times um, as a single guy and entrepreneur, I was, I was less sustainable. I was more risk taking. And now as a family of two, uh, trying to be more sustainable in the decision making process. Yeah, you know, when you talk about long term, man, it's it's so important that uh, you play, play in the long game, you know, and, and I, uh, I, I, I wear people out with my same old comment that I always talk about imagine what six months from now. So no matter what happens right now, no matter the ar argument I get in the conversation, the disagreement, something bad happens, will I remember this exact situation hmm. six months from now or a year from now? And chances are I probably won't. I mean, so there's no, if that's the answer. And there's no reason to get upset about it. Let's just work our way through it and we'll move on with life because I won't remember this conversation either. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. The other cool thing about podcasting too, and this is what I, I, I keep telling everybody, hey, if you, if, if you ever want to start a podcast, right now is the time to start a podcast and do this and do it for the right reasons. And, and one of the reasons I started the podcast was to have this message that, uh, you know, my kids, my grandkids can go back and listen to, hey, what type of person was my dad? And mm. there's so many podcasts on there that, uh, you know, when I first started, I got the best advice ever that no one's going to listen. So it doesn't really matter. So if you're listening to this episode, um, start a podcast and, and just do it selfishly for yourself, for yourself in order to give back to your family. Because when you have mm. to, when you do it in the right way for the right reasons, the true power of the podcast will come out and your voice will be heard to the people that need to hear it. So uh, big shout out to everybody. Start a podcast, email, email me, Jeremy, Jeremy I'll show you how to. The question number three is how has failure shaped your life? Yeah, failure shaped my life in big ways. Um, I think uh, one major example is my professional golf career. I didn't reach the PGA Tour, which was the goal to get a card in the PGA Tour and compete out there. And, and so failure characterized a lot of it from a results standpoint. But what I realized is that um, failure isn't fatal and failure isn't final, meaning just because you don't reach the destination you had set out to doesn't mean it isn't going to be a success in some way. Um, and those years of, of pursuing professional golf, while it had a lot more failure than success, it prepared me for all the things that were to come after professional golf and the work that I'm doing today. And just by doing it to the best of my ability, as well as I could in those moments, I was prepared for that next step. So failure is only uh, a failure if you don't use it well uh, and learn from the lessons in those moments. Question number four uh, from the book, John Maxwell's uh, book, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions is, uh, who do you know that I should know? Mm. I would say 
there is actually a company uh in orange county and i'll have to think of the name but i can sync you guys up who does um some post-production work for podcasts so okay. if if you're looking to um offload some of the podcast work they do a great job of editing post-production and creating blog post transcription uh for episodes so that could be a good resource yeah absolutely i'll take it um you know there's a um i, I thought about doing that a lot just maybe maybe doing some of the work, but you know, with, well, I, I'd definitely be interested in, t- in taking a peek at that. Who else, who in your life has just blown you away? Who's a role mm. model? Like, who do you look yeah. up to? Yeah. There's a guy. Um, there's a, there's a couple that come to mind. Uh, one would be a guy named Jamie Winship and he's out of uh, the Northwest. And Jamie's a guy who um, he is aligned with my faith and that he is a Christian, but he lives a life of radical faith and, and really um, asking God for direction and then following in moment to moment life, which is very rarely done, uh, including myself, I struggle with doing that too. So it's it's an incredible example of faith. And he's had um, 20 to 30 years of of wild experiences uh, and results to tell of it, including some, uh, I think he spent 15 to 20 years in the Middle East with a young family in high conflict regions, um, working with the government, but also teaching over there. And, um, and he was living by faith in that, in those scenarios too, which is, there's some crazy stories. Uh, and it's just uh, powerful to see his humility in that and his ability to just walk by faith. Uh, so Jamie Winship's a great guy. Um, and then the other guy that, uh, I really respect and admire a ton is a guy in, in LA named Brian Larrabee. Brian Larrabee, is a guy who's heading this program called Good City Mentors. I've been able to be a part of now for a couple of years. And really it's just going in and mentoring high school students for an hour once a week-ish. Um, and it's a leadership program for students that get nominated, but really it's students that could use just a positive influence in their life. And the beautiful thing about this program is that not only do the students get benefit from it, but the mentors, myself included, oh, sure. get so much benefit just from being around those kids, learning from them, and then also um, going through these reminders of what the core principles of leadership look like and and how yeah. to incorporate them. And uh, so I'm just so grateful for that program. And Brian Larby is just a sweetheart of a guy and really cares a ton about people. Um, he's doing great work. You know, as you're going through this, and I've done these, I think this is episode, I don't know, 400 and... 79 or 480 something a lot of episodes and i've asked that question a lot of, pretty much in all most of my interviews and it just goes to show that if you want to find good people they're out there you know what yeah. i mean i mean there are so many good people doing so many good things and when i ask that question i've i've never had the same answer you know what i'm saying yeah. it's, it's just and again it just goes to show you when you're looking at the positive side of everything man there are so many people out there and all you got to do is look and there and there's so many people that want to help mm. Um, it's, it's extremely important to understand no matter where you are, if you're in a dark place or struggling and you don't know who to talk to, man, just start talking to people. I think mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing is just ask for help and you're going to be blown away with all the people are just, that are just right outside of your comfort zone. Mm. Uh, question number five is what have you read that I should read? Mm. Oh, there's, I love books. I, I wish I had all day to read and I wish I was a speed reader. So I get through more of them. Um, the two books I think that come to mind, um, right now, as of this last year or so of reading, would be one would be Anti-Fragile by Nassim Tlaib. Um, it's a pretty big book. It's like seven books in one. He broke breaks it up into like seven mini books within one. Um, and a little bit in the weeds, he's kind of a deep writer. But with that being said, it's a great idea and concept for where we are today. His idea is that we work so hard on developing resiliency, when in reality, that's not what we should be focusing on. Resiliency isn't anti-fragility. Anti-fragility means that you benefit from chaos. Resiliency, if you shake the box and it's resilient, the thing just stays the same. But anti-fragile means if you shake the box, the thing inside gets better. So how do we develop people that are anti-fragile? I mean, they get better with chaos and change because the world is filled with change. The world is filled with chaos. Oh, yeah. So if we can develop humans that actually benefit and grow in those times versus just stay resilient or durable, um, we're going to be way better off um, because we're horrible at predicting the future. And yeah, right. he does a good change. job. Whatever we, whatever we predict is going to change. And then the other one that impacted me this last year, and that's fitting, I think, for where we find ourselves in the world today is uh, The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. 
Um, it was written in the 50s, and it's on the nature of mass movements. And nowadays, there are mass movements in every single category you can find, right? Um, and everybody has a group and a movement they're a part of. Um, and he really breaks down the caricature of the people involved and what um, history shows about mass movements and the characters involved in the flow and the different um uh, I guess, uh, steps involved in it. Uh, and I found it to be really insightful uh, and helpful to just discern what's going on in the world we see it today. Question number six is what have you done that I should do? You know, um, I, I think uh, one of the most, I, I don't know, have you written a book? I just did. You know what? Okay. Boom, there Gone. it is. Just, just got yes. it out about uh, six weeks ago. And that was a life-changing transformation that is for sure that's amazing have uh so i i was gonna say if you haven't written a book write a book because you learn so much about yourself in the process and uh and it's so helpful in clarifying your thinking that it's worth its weight in gold but you've already done that so i would say um what have i done that you need to do hmm you know, great, I think that question, I, the process, the process of, de I developed a couple online courses. Um, the process of doing that was really uh, growing in the sense that um, just trying to think creatively about how do people learn? How do we learn as human beings has helped me, I, I think, learn better myself. Um, and, and I think it's a valuable process to go through, especially if there's um, an area where you feel you've got um, experience and process that people can benefit from. I think nowadays it's so accessible, similar to podcasting, um, to find the right platform to create it on. And, and it's pretty feasible financially, um, that it's, it's a good process, learning process to go through for yourself too. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because that is something I want to do that I don't, I've, I've created, you know, I've, I've spoke a bunch of, a bunch of times, but I've actually never created the course. That was one of my, my things I've got to do this year, multiple courses that make you know, to, to increase residual income as well. That's mm -hmm. obviously important. Um, and, you know, I, I know that sounded selfish, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And obviously to help people, you know, I mean, that's the, yeah. I mean, that's all I can do. I don't know how to do anything else besides help people and, and inspire people. So if, uh, but if I can create a course to help them as well as help me, why not? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, final question. Question number seven is how could I add value to you? Well, I think this is step number one. This is fun getting to talk with you to think through things. I just have value added to me by the questions you ask and having to think through um, these answers. So that's already done in some ways. Um, and the other is just to keep spreading positivity in the world. I mean, I, I really believe that, um, like you mentioned earlier, in the sense of uh, discipline, I, you know, I, I would, the one caveat I would add is that I don't think discipline happens by chance, meaning I think as humans, we default to the path of least resistance and we do build bad habits that can be framed as disciplines, but, but really it's the path of least resistance. It's following whatever we feel like in the moment, but discipline is taking the path of most resistance saying, I need effort and intention to go upstream. Um, and really positivity is that. Positivity doesn't happen by chance. Uh, we don't just naturally uh, see the sunshine in the midst of clouds. We have to sometimes fight for it and look for it. And so I really think um, the more that we can further that message and, and encourage people in that way um, and try to be catalysts for hope, I think it'll be really helpful um, in the world because more and more people that are consuming, whether it be social media news or whatever it is um, that they're reading or consuming are being filled with negativity and uh, despair. So we need to counteract that as much as we can. Absolutely. You know, Jim Rohn said it best, uh, motivation is like bathing. If you don't do it every day, you start to stink. And that <laughs> is for real. I mean, that's so, 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 so real. Thank, tell everybody around the, the galaxy where they can find you. <laughs> uh, famemarcus.com is my headquarters so that's a great place to find uh, the books blogs podcast courses etc um, and to reach out I have an email or connect form on there would love to hear from you uh, fame marcus and all the socials uh, so yeah it would be great to connect well, I appreciate your time, my friend. I know you're busy. I know it's, uh, you got a lot of things going on. Um, I know you got to go to the gym. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure you got to do that tonight still too. But man, I just really appreciate you jumping on. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of podcasts out there and, and, and really the people I get on my show, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for like, um, you know, scientific people or all this. I mean, I'm looking for people that are motivational, inspirational and have a story to tell. So I appreciate you more than you know, jumping on. 
uh, for everybody out there, obviously find them, subscribe, uh, find them everywhere, send them emails, do everything you possibly can. Uh, all the show notes will be in, in the bottom of this podcast. You can, I'll have the links for, for Thane as well. So check those out. If you have any questions for me, like always, you know, Jeremy at jeremytodd.com. I say that every single episode, you've got greatness within. Like always, this is The Positive Side. <laughs>